Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're very pleased to have you for this webinar today. We are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Finance Office Hour. We are going to be having a facilitated discussion on the No Surprise Billing Act today. And now, without any further delay, I am going to go ahead and hand things over to Jervine Williams to get us started for today. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Olivia. Go ahead to the next slide. Well, thanks, you guys, so much for joining us. First, we have to have the disclaimer. All of this is new with everything going on here lately. So, with everything, this is for educational purposes, and please make sure you con consult with your legal counsel before you do any put anything into place for these new regulations. Next slide. So we have an action-packed agenda today. So we have all our presenters here. These are like the FQHC all-stars. So I'm really feel honored and privileged to be with everyone here today. We're going to kick off with Susanna, who's a partner at Felsman Tucker, who is our go-to person on Medicare and all things CMS. Then we have our own Jeremy Crandall, who is our in-house director of federal and states affairs, that's going to give us some things on what we're doing on the next front. I'm going to just throw in a couple of things on implementation thoughts, and then we'll have Ray Jorgensen talk about. Um, flat rate sliding fee and prompt pay discount. And then we're going to wrap up the discussion with Scott Gold, who's with BKD, and Rebecca, who's also um, the president of Achieve Revenue Cycle Management, to talk about some of the workflow considerations. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Susanna to get us started. Thank you very much, Jervine and Livia. Um, so I'm going to kick off the, the discussion today by giving an overview of a specific provision of the No Surprises Act, um, and more importantly, how it's been implemented in regulations. So the No Surprises Act was part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act um, of, of 2021, enacted at the end of December last year. Um, no Surprises in general um, is a, it's a pretty wide ranging law that affects providers, plans, a lot of duties by the federal agencies, um, but the main uh, purposes of the law were to eliminate certain surprise billing events that occur for insured individuals who um, accidentally access out of network services. That's sort of one part of it. And then there's a whole part of the law relating to transparency of information about the price of healthcare services. And it's that second part that this um, requirement we're going to talk about today is located in. It's section 112 of the No Surprises Act, and it relates to providing a good faith estimate of the charges of services that are scheduled to occur in the future. Um, so, I'm going to tell you um, briefly about what the statute says and then go um, somewhat um, play by play as to how the regulation describes providers' obligations um, to provide this good faith estimate. So, what the law says is that each healthcare provider and healthcare facility effective for services as of January the 1st of next year, um, a couple weeks from now, um, is required to provide certain information to um, health plans for privately insured patients and to patients in the event that they are self-pay or uninsured patients about the estimated cost of services. Um, so the, here's how it works. If a, pa if a patient makes an appointment with the provider at least three business days before the date the service is scheduled, then the provider must first inquire if the individual is enrolled in a group health plan, individual insurance, or a federal health care program. Um, and if they are so enrolled, if they're seeking to have a claim submitted. Um, and next, the Uh, Did we lose Susanna? Service. Yes. Okay. I lost you for a second. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Did. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Um, so, a notification of the expected charges for the item or service with the expected billing and diagnostic codes for the item or service. Next slide, please. So, what the law says is that there are two parts of this good faith estimate requirement. Um, as relates to privately insured individuals, the provider would give this good faith estimate information to the private health insurance plans, which would turn around and generate what, what the law refers to as an advanced explanation of benefits for those individuals. 
This portion of the law has not been implemented by the federal agencies at this time. So this top bullet on this slide, look out for this to happen in the future. But as of right now, no good faith estimate information is being required for the privately insured individuals. Um, and then the next thing the law requires is in the case of an individual who is not enrolled in a uh, private insurance uh, plan uh, or a federal health benefit program, uh, the provider sends to that individual uh, this good faith estimate. So that second bullet refers to the uninsured or self-pay patients, and that's what we're talking about today. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to tell you about how HHS and other federal agencies have implemented that requirement in the law via regulation. The first thing I want to emphasize is um, the implementing regulation that was issued this October 7th is a final regulation. The agencies did seek comment. Um, it's called an interim final rule with comment period, but it's it's in final form. And to the extent that the agencies respond to the comments, including NACs, that would have to occur through amendments to a regulation that's already out there on the books. Um, so, as I noted previously, these requirements in the red um, at this time apply only to good faith estimates for the uninsured or self pay patients. Um, also, important to note the term healthcare facility for purposes of this requirement is defined broadly. So the requirement um, does include facilities and providers, and it does include federally qualified health centers. Um, and another important implementation note is that uh, this good faith estimate is required to include the charges um, for the service the patient asked for and also any um, um, services provided in conjunction. So think, for example, of labs or radiology services that would be provided in conjunction with a scheduled appointment. Uh, the regulation creates this concept of convening providers, and that's the provider that's the point of first entry, and that provider is required to get the estimate to the patient, as well as collecting information from what they call co-providers, which would be the referral providers of um, services such as, as labs or radiology. Next slide, please. So, to go into this convening provider concept in a bit more detail, as I mentioned, the convening provider is the provider who receives the initial request for a good faith estimate. Um, the triggering event for you to need to provide this estimate is that either a patient uh, schedules an appointment with you at least three days in advance of, of the, the date that the service is going to occur, or the patient requests a good faith estimate. So patients can basically shop. They can call and ask you for a good faith estimate, even if they're not scheduling the service. Um, and also important to note, if they're scheduling the service less than three days in advance, you don't have to provide this estimate. Um, the co-provider or co-facility -facil is that, um, that connected, that provider of the connected or referral service. So in the case of a primary care provider, um, you're um, seeing a patient with a joint issue, you know you need a radiological service um, that wouldn't be provided in the health center. The radiology provider would be considered a co-provider. Um, so as I noted, and then as the reg has been drafted, the convening provider, which health centers would be, is under the obligation to get that estimate to the patient, including any information about the services the co-provider might furnish. Next slide, please. So, this is the sort of sequence of events. Once a patient schedules an appointment with you at least three business days in advance or asks you for the estimate, um, as, as described in the law as well, the provider has to ask the individual if they're enrolled in a group health plan or individual health insurance coverage or a federal health care program. And I'm going to stop briefly there and note um, that the term federal health care program uh, definitely includes Medicare, Medicaid, uh, CHIP, WIC, um, the federal programs that, that uh, directly um, finance services, or in the case of Medicaid, federal state programs. 
Um, but that term also more broadly encompasses situations where the federal government financially supports services through a way that's not insurance. So, for example, CMS has clarified that patients in Indian Health Service facilities are beneficiaries of a federal health care program just by virtue of that IHS role. And those individuals, because they're federal health care program enrollees, are not considered uninsured for purposes of this regulation and would not need to get the good faith estimate. Um, so if the person um, is enrolled in one of those programs or insurance, you, you ask them if they want to have a claim submitted, i.e. do they want to proceed through their insurance or do they want to proceed as self-pay? Um, and then you have to inform the person that a good faith estimate is available and will be furnished to them um, and then proceed if they've scheduled services that entail associated um, services to contact the co-providers or co-facilities and commence to putting this estimate together. Next slide, please. So um, there, the, the, the No Surprises Act in general has a lot of requirements about informing patients about the protections available to them. And that's true of this good faith estimate. Um, not only do you have to provide the patients with the estimate in certain circumstances, but you have to let them know that they're entitled to it. So you're required under the law to include a notice both on your website and in your facility about the availability of this good faith estimate. CMS has a whole uh, battery of different uh, templates and um, uh, uh, form documents relating to no surprises, and I've included on this slide, a hyperlink to the CMS folder where you can access a model disclosure about the availability of the good faith estimate. So you're required to put it on your website, post it in your facility, and also uh, orally inform patients at the time they make their appointment or ask for the estimate that it's available. Uh, next slide, please. Timeframes. Um, Something that I, I've mentioned before, but at risk of belaboring the point, if a patient makes a, an appointment for a same day sick uh, uh, service or the next day, um, that's not far enough in advance for them to be entitled to this estimate. So um, they, they have to be scheduling it at least three days out for these rules to kick in. So when they schedule an appointment at least three business days in advance, um, but, but less than 10, then you have to get the estimate to them within one business day after they schedule it. If they schedule the item at least 10 days out, then you have to get the estimate to them within three business days. And if they're simply calling to ask about the cost, but not making an appointment, then you need to get the estimate to them within three business days out of after the date of the request. Now, providing the estimate, um, that isn't defined in the regulation, but if you are mailing this estimate, my interpretation is that posting the, the document would qualify as providing it if you get that done within the timeframes uh, required in the rules. Next slide, please. Um, so, um, there is a, there's a, not only a template notification of the availability of a good faith estimate, but there is also a model good faith estimate in this folder that I referenced. There's a hyperlink here and also a document that gives all the data elements, the required components of a good faith estimate and tells you the details about them. And I'm going to go through them here. Um, I think my co-presenters who are um, you know, billing and operational experts will have important detail to flesh this out. Next slide, please. I know so many of you on the line who are operational uh, experts at your health centers are scratching your heads about this because in the primary care setting, when a patient calls, they may have a vague complaint about a headache or their child running recurrent fevers, and you don't know what service they're requesting. But these are the fields required in, in this regulation. So you're supposed to give the primary item or service the patient is requesting. And then you're supposed to itemize the items or services expected to be furnished in response to that request. 
Items or services is defined as all encounters, procedures, medical tests, supplies, prescription drugs, DME provided in conjunction with the provision of health care. So it's broad. Um, in my interpretation as to prescription drugs, the only uh, situation where you would include those costs would be if it's a drug that's being furnished in the context of the appointment, like a physician administered drug. Um, and importantly, the agencies clarified in the preamble that the items or services include dental, vision, SUD, and mental health services. So this is a broad uh, uh, concept of healthcare services. Um, and then I did want to note that for the co-providers, those referral providers, et cetera, the agencies did say in the preamble that they intend to exercise enforcement discretion during calendar year 2022. Uh, layperson's uh, reading of that is they're not, you won't incur compliance consequences if you fail to include the co-providers information on your estimate during calendar year 2022. HHS is acknowledging that that's going to be um, a tough part of all this to implement. Next slide, please. So the estimate also has to include applicable diagnosis codes, expected service codes, and expected charges associated with each item or service. Um, as for the diagnosis codes, the reg defines that as meaning um, that I, a, a code in the ICD code set. As for service codes, that means um, a, a code in the CPT, HIC, DRG, or NDC code set. So we're talking about specific items and services and their associated codes. Um, <clears throat> as for the expected charge, if you're dealing with an uninsured or self-pay patient um, who is not entitled to discounts, so in the health center situation, over 200%, that charge should be based on the health center's uh, charge master, not on, on payers fees or, or any other standard. So it would be the charge in your charge master associated with the uh, CPTs and HICPICs you've listed for the services. Uh, the estimate is required to reflect any discounts the individual would receive. So if it's an individual who has already been determined eligible for your sliding fee discount schedule, you would provide them with that charge inclusive of whatever discount they are entitled to in their sliding fee class. And if you have a flat fee sliding fee policy, then you, what you would provide as the uh, estimate would be their flat fee based on their sliding fee class. Next slide, please. Uh, the estimate is also required to include the name, MPI, and TIN of each provider or facility listed on the estimate. And importantly, a list of the items or services that the convening provider anticipates will require separate scheduling. So I think a, a frequently occurring example of this might be a complex dental procedure. A patient calls with a, a dental catastrophe that has happened and you know that they first are gonna need an extraction and then later they'll need restorative services. It's okay for your estimate to include only the extraction and you would list on the estimate. You will need to make a follow up appointment for uh, the restorative services and the cost of those is not included here on the estimate. Next slide please. Disclaimers, these estimates are required to include a lot of disclaimers. They're all listed in the regulation. And the disclaimers are also covered in the model good faith estimate on the CMS website. So if you don't want to reinvent the wheel, interpreting the regulation and providing your disclaimers, you could use verbatim uh, the language from the, the CMS model. Uh, but one important thing about it to note is you're, no, you're telling the patient that this is only an estimate. It's not a guarantee that this GFE represents all that they'll have to pay. Um, you're notifying them that they can be eligible for um, an independent dispute resolution process if they want to contest the ultimate charges, more on that later. Um, and you're letting them know there may be additional items or services that need to be provided in follow-up that are not encompassed on this estimate. Next slide, please. Format for the estimate. Um, the regulation states the estimate has to be provided in the manner the patient requests. 
either by on paper or electronically as the patient uh, prefers. If it's provided electronically, the, the reg says it must be in a format the patient can both save and print. So an email could meet that, a uh, patient portal communication could meet that as long as the patient can save and print the information. And importantly, if it's done electronically, it must be in a manner with all health information, privacy, and security protections. So there's going to be PHI in these estimates, and so you would need to uh, use encryption and whatever policies you have to protect PHI in communicating with patients. Um, patients might ask for the information to be provided orally. You can do that, but you do also have to provide it in writing in order to meet these requirements. Next slide, please. Um, so the regulation states that this estimate is to be considered part of the patient's medical record. Um, you know, I'm aware that presents some interesting challenges, like a lot of this. For example, what if you have a person who's not an established patient who's merely calling to sort of shop for the price of services and you don't have a record set up for them? But the, the red does require it be treated as part of the medical record. Um, your EHR vendors may be coming to you with potential solutions about incorporating this functionality in the EHR or practice management system, and that's worth um, looking into for sure. Um, the red specifies that you have to keep a copy of this estimate for um, at least six years so that you can provide a GFE from the last six years to the patient. And that's true even if the patient um, uh, doesn't request a copy of it, you have to just make sure you have it on file. Um, the, the reg does have some sort of safe harbors to the extent a provider uh, makes a good faith error in furnishing an estimate. Um, that's not an instance of non-compliance with these rules. Um, you know, I think in our view, that doesn't really go far enough because um, the, the, there needs to be an acknowledgement that this estimate is inherently speculative when the provider has not yet um, seen the, the patient in the room and visualized their condition and even reached a diagnosis. Um, but the reg does at least have this concept that if you make a good faith error or rely in good faith on information from your co-providers, um, that doesn't constitute a failure to comply with the terms of this reg. Next slide, please. So as far as um, enforcement, the provider-oriented rules and no surprises, um, including this and including some, some of the surprise billing-related rules, uh, the states have primary authority to enforce those provisions. The law provides that if states um, are not substantially enforcing the requirements, and it's HHS that makes that determination, then HHS can take over enforcement. Um, HHS has been surveying the states as to what they intend to do on this. I don't think there's clear information out there as to which states have taken up the option to be the enforcing um, entity on these rules. Uh, if HHS does enforce, then it can apply civil money penalties in an amount up to $10,000 per violation. Um, and HHS did state in its proposed rule on enforcement of this law that they intend to conduct a small number, like 200 investigations all around the country um, each month of potential no surprises violations by providers or facilities. Next slide, please. <laughs> So there are two enforcement mechanisms that can be initiated by patients that are important to know about. Um, a patient can file a complaint with HHS if the patient believes that a provider or facility has failed to meet the requirements in the regs. Um, and HHS can then in turn turn that over to the state if it's enforcing or turn it over to this independent dispute resolution process if it relates to dispute about bill charges. And that brings me to the second mechanism. Um, the law requires HHS to operate an independent dispute resolution process, enabling patients to contest where the final bill charges from one provider are substantially in excess, which has been interpreted as $400 or more of the expected charges. 
If that threshold is met, then a patient can initiate this IDR process where an HHS designated dispute resolution entity uh, conducts a whole process to determine what the appropriate amount is to, to collect from the patient. Um, and um, that the feds can also delegate that to the state if the state is enforcing these provisions and the state has chosen to operate its own IDR uh, process. So I think that uh, culminates the material I had, and I'm going to turn it right over to Jeremy Crandall now. <clears throat> Thanks, Susanna, um, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have just a few, a couple of, a few, if you will, slides. Um, I'm going to try to whip through them without talking um, incredibly fast. Um, I'm also going to hold on, if everybody could bear with me. I'm going to, I work at NAC, I'm the director of federal and state policy, but I see that my, uh, my background is really being kind of funky right now. So I'm going to change that really quickly. So um, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so really the main piece that I want to talk about, you obviously just heard from Susanna about a lot of the particulars of this good faith estimate requirement. I just want to give you all a little bit of a policy meets politics, if you will, process background so that you all have the latest information about what we're doing um, to try to influence this. Um, first of all, you, you know, you heard all the particulars about this part two interim final rule. It is important for everybody to know and understand. I did see a question very early on. Um, it wasn't where did this come from? It was basically like, you know, a little bit of background about what this all is all about. And really this no um, this effort to address surprise billing um, as it impacts patients, but specifically the relationship between the, pay the provider um, and the insurer has been a long running issue at the federal level and at the state level as well. And so, um, unfortunately, frankly, this good faith estimate piece is one small item in a much larger issue that affects a lot of um, very um, influential and significant parts uh, players in the healthcare system. And so, this part two, um, as it relates to health centers, excuse me, the good faith estimate is in this part two as it relates to health centers, but there's an entire other part one that relates to the relationship between providers and insurers that part one the definition of facility does not include um, fqhc's which was a very good outcome it was something that we strongly advocated for um, so there is some good news if you will um, that there's a lot more related to this that, that ultimately does not apply to health centers if we go to the next slide please um, so what i wanted to do in this slide is give you all a, a quick snapshot about what is going on here so um, as i mentioned this is a long-running battle between um, significant players in the healthcare industry um, really one of our biggest challenges long running on this is that this is a top priority for key leaders on both sides of the aisle in the house and in the senate and so in many ways it has dra dramatically limited our options um, in terms of being able to influence this. But really throughout the year, what we have been doing is directly engaging with the Hill, with policy staff, and really the biggest piece of feedback that is important for you all to know is we did hear directly from um, some of the most senior level folks that influenced the, the legislation that the intention was to include FQHCs and all other providers um, as it relates to this good faith estimate. And so in the short term, our ability to be able to influence the statutory requirements is, is, is limited, is, if not non-existent. So it's gonna be a challenge. But what we have been doing is directly engaging with the Health and Human Services Department, the secretary uh, there, Secretary Becerra. Um, we've been directly engaging with the Bureau of Primary Health Care and HRSA um, and other agencies to really emphasize how drastic of a, of, a, of a requirement this is, but also the very close connection between the sliding fee discount program approach and what this good faith estimate um, requires. And so we've engaged in a very robust information gathering process over the last several months. Um, big hat tip to many of you that have responded to those inquiries to really talk through what the sliding fee discount program looks like. Um, and, and the last piece that I will say, is what is to come separate from actually implementing this, which you are gonna hear from my colleagues about um, in a minute. Um, really, we're not going away on this issue is, is what I wanna convey to you all. Um, this is an interim final rule, as Susanna uh, 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 said, you know, we have to act accordingly that this is going to be, this is going into effect um, in approximately two weeks, but that does not end our ability to be able to influence this. And so what we are going to be doing in the coming uh, months is continue to engage with you all. And I would highly encourage you as you work to implement this 
gather any anecdotal um, or uh, quantitative information you can um, as it relates to implementation of this. If it is not as big of a deal as, as we think, great, but ultimately if it is as big of a challenge as we expect, the more information you can provide us so that we can continue to engage with policymakers, um, the better. And so when that comes, I just can't report on that yet. We are really, we want to get through the next couple of weeks and then sort of reassess what our next move is going to be. But I just want to really emphasize with you all that we are going to continue to find ways that we can influence um, implementation of this policy. The last thing I will say, and then I'll stop, Jervin, I saw you come on camera, um, is that we did submit an extremely robust uh, comment letter as it relates to this good faith estimate or requirement. We outlined a number of, of avenues that we are hopeful that the Bureau, not the Bureau, excuse me, that HHS will take, whether a full on exemption for health centers um, or some other sort of process where the Bureau and HRSA can work with other agencies to come up with an approach that makes sense for health centers because of the unique way that we engage with our patients. We are operating under no illusion that there will be anything different between now and January 1. Um, but we are going to continue to advocate, um, you know, in the, in the months to come to try to seek the, the best outcome for you all. So I'm going to stop there, Jervine. I know we got a lot more to cover. Oh, thank you. I did want to plug. Oh, hold on. Can we go to the last slide? Um, I do want to plug that there are many states that are taking action on surprise billing as well. And one question that we we are getting consistently from the federal government is, are there any requirements as it relates to surprise billing writ large, but specifically this good faith estimate requirement where the uh, health center has to physically provide information to the patient um, requirements under state law. Um, is there any sort of requirement under state law where a health center has to provide something? Um, what the feds are asking is, do any of those types of state requirements exist? And are there exemptions for federally qualified health centers where we could use that as an indication that, look, there are other examples where states have taken action and they've recognized that the health centers are unique. So I'll put my email in the chat and you can all find me at, at NAC. But um, if anybody has anything on this, we're going to continue to look for it. Jervine, I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Jeremy. So I'll just come jump through these slides. So a couple of implement, implementation thoughts. First of all, you need to have someone who's gonna be your good faith estimate ambassador. And this cannot be someone at the front desk or scheduling. And probably since you're the one that signed up for the webinar, you might be that good faith estimate ambassador for your health center. What I mean by that is that whenever a patient comes, this is a person that's gonna trigger that process. So someone has to own that process. Secondly, you want to make sure you post it on your website, in your lobby, in your patient package. You need to make sure you communicate to your patient that they can request a GFC. And then after that, have a meeting that includes clinical, finance, and front office and IT staff to discuss how are you going to pull together the GFC using a CMS template as a guideline. And Rebecca is going to go over some more detail on that. But have a team together to have that discussion in your health and on what this is going to look like. Next slide. So CMS put a lot of um, templates out there, and my colleague Olivia's done it, emailed those out to you. But here's a sample of their public posting of the ability to request a GF a good faith estimate. Next slide. So now I'm going to turn it over to Ray. He's going to talk about some um, implementing the flat rate sliding fee and a prompt pay discount. These are a couple of different tools. Not a, it's not the silver bullet, but it's tools you can use in order to get beyond this good faith estimate. And we have a lot of questions. We're probably gonna run over. So just hold on you guys and we're gonna ask, we're gonna ask questions at the end, but we have a lot of content and I'll go ahead and turn it over to Ray. Thanks, Trevine, and thanks everybody for being here and um, for the folks who are participating on this panel. There was a great discussion and, and lots to learn and I've seen all the frustration in the, in the messaging and, uh, that's happening here in the chat and also before and just know that um, like everything else in healthcare, the one thing you can expect is constant change. So let's jump ahead here, next slide please, and uh, the one after. All right, so real quickly, our, um, when we look at HRSA, if you haven't read their compliance manual, which many of you may have not, but actually it's one of the most easy to read, easy to consume uh, documents, and chapter nine specifically talks about the sliding fee discount program, um, and you'll see sliding fee discount program and sliding fee discount scale, those terms used interchangeably. So uh, when we look at charges in general um, in, in healthcare, one of our obligations around charges is to make certain that we always charge more than what we expect to get paid. And the simple message around that is, especially when we came up with the new PPSG codes, gosh, that's almost 10 years ago now, 
that the PPSG codes, it used to be our all-inclusive rate, they'd pay us that full rate, whether our charges were high enough or not. And, but um, the rest of the world, the rest of the healthcare world, you got paid your charge or the provider, the payer's fee schedule, whichever was less. So um, our, our objective in healthcare in general, and even as health centers, is we wanna make sure our, our charges are above our highest paying payer. But because we are health centers, because we are receiving additional federal funding, we have to make sure, as it says here, that those charges, despite trying to keep them elevated to maximize reimbursement, are consistent with local prevailing rates, um, that they are designed to cover reasonable costs, that they are posted, and the board is approving them regularly. So that's, a, that's pretty common, although I will say I visit health centers and I'll meet a new CFO or a CFO has been there for a year or two and say, eh, we haven't updated our fee schedule or in, in two years, three years, five years, or, uh, you know, and, and this is a, a board responsibility as much as it is a finance team and certainly a CFO responsibility. So getting this regularly updated is important, not just for function, but also so that you're not all of a sudden fixing your charges and, and getting those fees going up and it's a 10, 15% hike instead of it being a very gradual 2% hike that's frankly much more palatable to your community. Um, you, as it says in that second bullet, must take all reasonable efforts to obtain payment from third party payers. We can't just default everybody to Medicaid, a payer of last resort um, uh, obligates anyone who's receiving money uh, from third party payers to make sure all third party payers are billed. There are some exceptions. Um, to that around privacy and uh, people who feel endangered if someone were to find they were there. And as uh, Javeen said, and I wanna emphasize, I'm not a lawyer, uh, any of these decisions, any of these conversations, we encourage you to have them with legal counsel and get that approved. I'm more than happy to have a conversation with anybody on this call or with the, the health center um, a CFO about this stuff. Uh, please reach out to me um, if, if, if there's interest. And I, you know, um, it's, it's, it, it certainly uh, can be very complex, but doesn't always need to be. But again, glad to talk about some of this, especially the sliding fee program we're gonna talk about here in a second. The schedule of discounts, this is critical, must be applied uh, based on ability to pay. So that's typically based on um, the, the federal poverty level. And in some instances when people don't have any income, we're gonna talk about what types of, uh, you have to have a, uh, predetermined um, uh, items that you will accept, whether it's a pay stub, whether it's a checking account, whether it's, uh, some, other, some of the sort of financial support letter that you're willing to accept. And as it says here, it's available for those with family income up to 200% of poverty. And I'm gonna talk about something called prompt payment, giving discounts to people over 200%, um, but we wanna make sure that you know, we're, we're complying with the law, which says the, the sliding fee discount program and can only work with people up to 200% of federal poverty. Uh, next line, please. Um, as I already indicated, we need these to be written. I'm encouraging you to have this on your website. Um, I'm encouraging you to also have it in your lobbies if you have people who are checking in with iPads to be something they can see electronically. As we already mentioned, we need board approval. There is a very specified structure. Eligibility requirements have to be clear uh, about proof of documentation. What are you willing to accept? And it needs to be consistent across all your sites. Uh, and that's just to make sure that everybody's being treated fairly, that we're not subjectively determining who's, who's eligible and who is not. Um, Self-declaration is fine, but what does that mean? What do you have to accept if someone's going to provide, someone can't just show up uh, and say, I don't make any money, and yet somehow they got there, they look like they've been eating and they're wearing clothing. We have to have some idea about that, what you're willing to accept and around self-declaration. And nominal charge, or what does that mean? It can be different um, from literally health center to health center, but if you're one health center with 15 clinics, you need to have some assurance that that's going to be consistently done, meaning nominal charges collected the, the same way at all 15 locations. Um, and then billing and collection policies. What, if, what are you going to, um, how are you gonna charge the patient? How are you gonna be certain that they're not overcharged? Um, and CMS, uh, excuse me, HRSA did add some language around refusal to pay. And this is hard for health centers to hear um, because um, of many health centers started out as free clinics. Um, but you know, if you if you determine that someone's eligible to pay a certain amount of money and they refuse to pay that money or make any effort towards it, which could even be a dollar a month, a dollar a week, whatever it is, you do have the right to say we're not going to see you anymore because you're refusing to pay. Not a common theme, not one I'm recommending, and certainly we're all in this health center marketplace to help those in need. But it is part of the HRSA policy. And again, if you haven't read it, I encourage you to do that. Next slide, please. Um, this was interesting too. I've had folks say to me, well, our commercial insurance contracts, I'm not legally, and I'll say the term legal, allowed to waive copays. Uh, HRSA made it very clear that these, that sliding fee discount program and, and those discounts apply to copays, coinsurance, deductibles, 
uh, and frankly, anything that you're going to be providing. You can have more than one slide. You can have one for dental and then one for medical. If you're getting um, Title uh, 10 money, uh, you could have a separate slide for Title 10. In fact, that would be different because those benefits go up to 250% of poverty. So you have to have some idea what rules exist and, and how you could lay those out. And you want to make it as clear as possible to your, your clientele so it's easy for them to understand. If you're going to waive fees, when might you do that? Uh, some people have decided to do it during uh, you know, a, a, a public health emergency. I mean, that would be really a big deal around this pandemic. Some folks have done that at some level. Um, I've worked with some healthcare for the homeless places that determined that they were going to uh, waive copays consistently. They had to get special permission from CMS because certainly uh, those are Medicare eligible. Medicare says you can't just blanketly waive coinsurance, but there, there are things you can do. You, again, I'm recommending check with legal counsel. And again, I'm glad to have a conversation with you if that's of interest. Next slide, please. So I already mentioned this briefly um, in charges, you're gonna get paid the lesser of your charge or the payer fee schedule. You always wanna try and charge more than what you expect to get paid. But in a health center in particular, you have to make sure that it's consistent, as we said, with local prevailing rates. Typically, we'd recommend looking at the Medicare fee schedule, literally the professional fee schedule. And I would expect rates to be 150 to 250%, um, meaning you're gonna multiply a $100 Medicare fee and that charge would be $150 to $250, depending on where you are. You can get very involved and do an RV, RVS, a resource-based relative value scale study. Um, but um, what some health centers do, frankly, they just call around and they check what other people are charging. That's local prevailing rates and they determine schedules that way. There are some very sophisticated, some very unsophisticated ways to do this. There's no right way to do it, but that underpayment management says someone has to be monitoring to make sure that your, that your charges are consistently outpacing what you're getting paid from third party payers. And if that's not happening, then you're probably leaving money on the table, which is what you'd like to avoid doing. Next slide, please. So prompt payment discount, I wanna to speak to this for a moment. And when we uh, talked actually in our pre-group, there was some assumption that I'm applying this prompt payment discount to only those over 200% of poverty. And I wanna emphasize in the different examples I'm gonna show you in a moment, some of which may be some of the folks on the phone. I just went out and grabbed some health center website detail and copied it and pasted it in here so y'all can see it and credits given in the URLs and, and down, down here. A prompt payment discount says that there's time value to money, that I'm willing to um, let someone pay less money today because at this moment in time, um, I, I don't have to bill them. I'm, I, I'm guaranteed to get money in house. Um, but, and it's, it's not part of the sliding fee discount scale uh, or the sliding fee discount program. I have a separate payment policy and that's essential. If a HRSA auditor comes in and were to see you having a discount program for people over 200% and that was part of your sliding fee discount program, that would be problematic because the regs very, very clearly state that the, the sliding fee discount program, your sliding fee discount scale can only go up to 200%, but you could have a separate standalone payment policy that says anybody over 200%, they're gonna get this, this discount. Now I'm encouraging that a flat rate program. And by that I'm saying that people at 100% of, of federal poverty, they pay, let's say, I'm making this up, I'm not telling you to do this, $20. Uh, if they're up to 125%, they pay $30. 126 to 150, they pay 40 all the way up. And let's say when I got above 200%, my prompt pay discount might be, if you pay us today, then um, your, your discount's gonna be, uh, your, your kind of what we we'll call the cafeteria. It's an all inclusive, you pay me 80 bucks and then you're fine, everything's covered. We can have some carve outs, we can do some other stuff, but we're essentially saying that we wanna come up with a very transparent schedule that even those who are over 200% of poverty would have some sort of benefit by doing this. So it's a matter of, thinking about how could we do this. Now, that fourth bullet, um, you know, if they're going to make a prompt payment discount, pay at time of service or with, with a, within a very fixed defined period of time. You're going to afford this discount to any entity. And not that means not just a person, but even a third party payer, because all of you will have third party payer contracts that talk about um, Best Buy, Favorite Nation, that they wanna make sure they're getting the best price. And, the, and so, what I've seen happen over time is people say, well, gosh, this payer got mad because we discounted what the person paid at the time of service. This is critical to understand. The charge has to remain constant. If I have a $100 charge um, and I'm going to bill that charge to Aetna, United, Blue Cross, um, everybody else, and they might pay me $60, $80, $50, whatever the number is, and you say, look, my prompt payment discount is going to go down to, again, I'm making this up, $40. Those plans might say, hey, you're paying us less, there, someone's getting less, a better deal, we want that deal. The reason we're giving that person this deal is because they're making that payment faster than those other third-party payers. So 
So, hey, Aetna, Medicare, Blue Cross, Cigna, if you want this discount, then you pay us on the day of service or within a week or, or whatever the deal is. And the payers don't pay that quickly. So, again, this is a larger, more broad conversation I'd love to have. But the point is we're giving any entity, not just an individual, the opportunity to take advantage of this um, more prompt payment discount. Uh, and as it says in that third indented bullet, it's not a reduced charge, but, but, an, but an adjustment down from the charge. The charges are constant. Everybody gets charged the same. We're affording discounts. Uh, financial hardship, that is very subjective. Someone's home might have burned down. Uh, someone could have a, a spouse who just passed. And we say, you know what, on us today, it's subjective. Only really one person at each health center should be allowed to make that sort of call, but it is one we recommend. Um, and, and the other thing I want to emphasize about the prompt pay discount, the legality of it, again, not a lawyer, but I'm looking one, two, three, the fifth indented bullet, legal because of pervasive application, it has to be consistently applied across all locations for all clients. Um, and, you know, we're affording that regardless of ability to pay, we can do a discount. And I'll show you how I tie this into those, into even the sliding fee discount program in a moment. Um, professional courtesy. Some health centers say, hey, there's no co-insurance for our staff. Not just for the staff we like, but for everybody. It, everyone who meets the criteria of being that VIP, um, they don't pay for that. Some people do it for local medical providers, other doctors, they don't do that. Whatever your policy is, it should be written down. It needs to be consistently applied. Um, and again, as long as it's unilaterally applied, consistently applied, there's, it's not should not be a legal issue. Uh, next slide, please. So this is an example of setting charges based on what the provider codes. So down the far left-hand column, you've got your office visit codes, uh, 99201 to 215. And I recognize I probably should have got rid of 99201 because it's no longer a valid code in 2021. But for the sake of throwing this together quickly, I apologize. I didn't delete that line. But you'll notice that the fees gradually increase as I go from, in this case, category one through five. Um, and then in category six, that's my prompt payment discount that's greater than 200%. And then the last three columns to the right are just proposed charges that I might put. This was something we put together years ago for a client just to say, hey, what will we charge for services? Now, you'll notice that $10 is a minimum and nominal fee, and that's why you won't see anything less than that anywhere on, the, on, this, uh, on this chart. The, the challenge with doing this is let's say I did an office visit, I did a surgery, I did a diagnostic test, I did a, uh, maybe some sort of imaging. I'm going to have four, five, six different codes that somehow I've got to add up, figure out what schedule they're in. And by the way, I'm assuming that the provider is going to actually get the visit coded at the time of service. My experience visiting hundreds of health centers is providers are still not getting their codes done for, if they're doing really well a few days, in some cases it's, it's seven to 10 days. So I can't get providers to give me coding um, and then expect me to be able to spend the bill, which is why this whole legislation, in Ray's humble opinion, is kind of ridiculous that we're supposed to give them an ICD and a CPT code ahead of time, and we can't even get our providers to code the stuff on the date of service. I'm going down a, a whole bad rabbit hole there. But my, my, with, where I'm proposing here is that instead of doing this individually by individual HICPICS codes, we're going to instead just go with one flat rate. Next slide, please. Um, so the, 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 the flat rate sliding fee follows the sliding fee discount policies but it's essentially a per diem rate, one flat rate, instead of me giving a price to each individual service that's done. We have seen anecdotally payment go way up, like self-pay numbers increase because patients know what to pay, they know what's expected, front desk knows what to collect, um, and it just it, it saves everybody the hassle of trying to figure all this stuff out. It's certainly um, easier to comply with no surprise billing because I know up front what patients are going to pay for the work that, they're, that you're going to provide. There's no, gosh, what's this bill going to be? I'm not going to be surprised. Look, based on the sliding fee, there's only one rate you're going to pay. It's this much money if you're at this level. And even if you're over 200%, if you pay us at the time of service or let's say within two weeks, three weeks, or 30 days, it's this flat rate. We're telling you up front this is what it would be. But again, the more readily published rates, easier for folks to follow. Um, it's really difficult to explain all the different charges. And if the coding's not done on time, I can't have it happen consistently. And I do see staff, even well-trained staff, interpret different things you know, just differently because it, it, it's, this is complex. Healthcare is hard. And trying to explain to people how it works and why, why we set charges, and, you know, it, it's nuts. So this flat rate is just easier to understand for everybody and much easier from a compliance perspective. Next slide, please. So this is an example of a, a medical slide. It's a few years old. You can see it's back from, um, gosh, it's a decade old now, back to 2011. But notice we took 
the income, and this is obviously older because it's the 2011 income guidelines, and I didn't, again, have time to create this for this current income guideline, but across the top, category zero up to 50%, they don't pay us anything. 50 to 100%, let's say that's their nominal fee, it's 15 bucks. 100 to 149.9 is $30, 150 is 50, and anything over, um, this is our payment policy, anything over 200%, they pay $75. And notice at the very bottom, and I don't know if we've got a cursor um, that, that we could use to kind of indicate where it says 20% discount for same day payment, and then to the right, 10% discount for payment within 30 days. So one of the challenges around the prompt pay, and some of our lawyers here have made the statement, look, you can't do a prompt pay discount and not apply it to those on the sliding fee. This, the, the, they're saying anybody over 200% of poverty, there's one flat rate, $75. But if you pay us today, all these rates above will give you a 20% discount. And if you pay us within 30 days, we'll do a 10% discount. The challenge in Ray's mind around the sliding fee is that $30, that in category two, let's say, whether the patient pays you today or a year from now, the most you can charge them is $30 because that's where they fall in the schedule. The over 200% of poverty, because it's not part of the sliding fee discount program, all bets are off if they don't pay you, according to this, this deal, within 30 days. That it's going to be 20% on same data service, 10% off of that if you pay us within 30 days. But you could write a, a program for anybody over 200%. That payment policy could say, if you don't pay us within 30 days, then it goes back up to full rate. And you have to, we're, we're going to charge you like we would anybody else. That's up to you and your team to figure out what that looks like. What I'm suggesting, though, is how simple this is to post this on your website and say, here are the diff you, here's where you find out what your income level is, here's how much it's going to cost you to come, and if you're not sure, the most you're going to pay out of pocket is $75, and it's essentially an all-inclusive price. Now, notice also at the very bottom, the excludes, we're going to exclude lab services, there are some procedures, maybe some supplies, that makes sense, and, and it should because... We can't, we don't know what all these things are. Maybe that will put us at too much financial risk, so we want to carve those out. Next slide, please. Now, this is a dental slide that we're going to go over here real quickly. And you'll notice that it's a little more expensive because dental is a little more expensive. You'll see the same discounts at the bottom, 20% for same day, 10% um, for, for the next. And then you'll see some different carve-outs at the bottom because dental is pretty expensive. So what, when we're looking at, you know, trying to make this transparent, we are giving this to the patients on the website, then we'd be putting it in the lobby so it's able to be seen. Great to have a financial counselor that could explain this. And even as Javeen was talking about having, you know, your, your ambassador, this is a much more simple thing to be able to provide to folks than trying to figure out what an estimate's going to be before they've been seen, before we know what's, what's going to happen. We certainly, I don't know how you'd pick the HICPICS codes. I mean, that, that's all, one issue with the legislation. ICD-wise, maybe you could grab that if they're uh, historic patients, but for, for new patients, I don't see how simple that would be to do. In fact, I don't think it's simple at all. So let's jump ahead to the, I'm just gonna walk through these next examples just a little bit. This is from, come from Heart City Health, and this was on their Ray, website. We're running, is, we're running close on time, so if you could wrap it up pretty quick, that'd be great. You got it, you got it. So what you can do, just flip through these different next slides. Y'all can look at these later on. They're just examples of sliding fees from some other folks. Um, and I just did this to show people are already doing this. These schedules already exist. Um, look at some of these, see, see which ones you like. And again, I'm glad to have a conversation. Uh, these last few are all from the same health center. This is one of three, so you can go through all of them. But this is how they break it down and hopefully make it easy for folks to see. I'll pause there, Javine. I apologize for the length. And uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Thanks so much, Ray. We'll turn it over to Rebecca and Scott to wrap up things. All right, real quick, um, just a couple of high-level thoughts on financial considerations. I know Ray did a good job of, of highlighting a, a lot of the impact related to sliding fee, but really for the CFOs on the call, I know I'm fielding a lot of questions related to, you know, what, what do we really need to be thinking from, you know, the financial side of the house? You know, is this going to have some impact on our financial statement audit per se? Um, How's this flow through the cost report? You know, some of those types of things that are on our minds. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, you know, any change that we make in the organization relative to, you know, implementation of, of this is likely going to have a, a financial impact. You know, think about the staffing um, additions that you may need to be in compliance. Those costs are going to roll up and, and have an impact on, 
you know, the bottom line. So we just need to kind of think about, um, you know, how this is going to impact the organization and how that flows through. Now, as far as the compliance goes on the audit, um, I have not caught wind that there's going to be specific audit considerations that would maybe roll under the uniform guidance as of yet. But, you know, compliance in general is something that in the audit environment, you know, if, if there's no non-compliance related to laws and regulations and things of that nature, um, you know, that can become a reportable item on an audit. So I, I think we just want to, you know, take it seriously and, and, and make sure we do the best we can. But the, the practical side of it is, you know, we're going to have to, you know, navigate a lot of the, the, the things that are there. Re Rebecca, thoughts on, on that as, as you roll forward with a lot of your conversations? Yeah, so thank you, um, Scott. And I know that we are getting close to the end of our time and Scott mentioned a couple things. And in the Q&A, uh, we have seen some comments about additional staffing. Um, and so I do think as we consider the operational impact of health centers, that that can also be something that we have to think about from a financial standpoint is, is there an additional cost to the health center in terms of staffing to be able to implement the regulations and the requirements um, for this particular uh, regulation? So if we can go ahead and move on to the next slide, I appreciate you all allowing us a few extra moments. I know we are right to time, but I do hope to be able to offer up some practical takeaways as we get to the conclusion of our time and then uh, the ability to be able to address some of your questions that have come through either in advance or since we have been on the webinar together. So in the working the conversations that I have had with health centers uh, most recent on this topic, you know, it certainly is not surprising um, that the implementation of this requirement feels overwhelming and I can appreciate that. So really where I have been focusing with health centers is just getting started. So breaking the requirements down, even considering the templates that we're going to be uh, reviewing and that Susanna and Jervine already mentioned, but then really moving forward in terms of being compliant with this requirement instead of being, I, I think, somewhat paralyzed by what seems to be kind of the overwhelming expansiveness of it and the impact that it has on our day-to-day -day operations. Um, one of the first places to start with the patient awareness. So we've talked about that briefly already, and so I will mention it again. There is a requirement for us to make patients aware of their right to a good faith estimate. So for providers and facilities, we are required to inform our uninsured or self-pay patients of their right for a GFE or a good faith estimate. It does need to be on the organization's website, um, also displayed near your scheduling or similar, similar areas. So that may be your financial counseling areas, maybe it's your checkout stations, but in areas where patients are likely to be having conversations about their services and the potential cost of those services or potentially scheduling appointments. Um, awareness of the patient um, right or um, their eligibility, if you will, to receive a GFE, I think is important also for staff to understand because of the fact that we know that for uninsured patients or patients who are scheduling appointments um, three days in advance that they have um, the option or we need to provide, excuse me, the GFE to them, um, individuals can also um, inquire about the cost of services. So there does need to be awareness when patients are asking about how much they owe, even though they may not formally ask for a GFE, that that still should be treated as if the patient was um, requesting an estimate. So let me just repeat that. So a patient may not formally have the exact language in terms of I want to request a good faith estimate, but if the patient is having communications with members within the health centers and they are asking about the cost of potential services or items, that that should be viewed and treated by the organization as the request of a um, good faith estimate, even if they are not scheduling an appointment at that time. There are templates that will be provided to you. This is on your screen. A 
a screenshot of the um, notification for the patient awareness. So the patients do have the right to receive the good faith estimate. You'll note at the bottom of that slide that, that it does refer patients to the specific portion of the CMS website for the no surprises uh, rule. And so there is a dedicated portion of the CMS website. I feel it's pretty limited at right now. So if you are to go out there, I think the information that's there is limited, but anticipate as we continue to move forward, there'll be additional guidance for patients um, and for providers on that dedicated portion of HM or CMS's website. If we could move to the next slide. Um, the good faith estimate content. So Susanna reviewed the data elements to you with you, and the data elements were actually outlined pretty specifically for us. In addition to that, there is a good faith estimate template that you could use from CMS. The template um, as it stands with disclaimers is eight pages long. So it is very lengthy. So one of the things I want to note, while the information in the template may all be good information, um, that if you compare that to what's actually required, you may be able to reduce some of the data elements. So the template's a good place to start, but there are certain elements that are on the template that are actually required in the data element um, appendix that was provided to us. So we do have the patient name of birth, um, the description of primary services and the um, CPT and ICD-10 codes. I wanna talk about that for a moment. Um, the description of the primary services or items that are being rendered does need to be in clear and understandable language um, for the patient. So we have to give them both the description and the narrative of the service that's being provided in addition to the CPT and the ICD-10 codes. And I'll talk about that here um, in just a moment too. So thinking about the good faith estimate and the elements that need to be um, listed we are required to provide the patient name, date of birth, the, the description, the CPT, the ICD-10 codes, the expected charges, and the names of the providers and facilities along with their NPIs and tax ID numbers. So there is quite a bit of information that is required. And there is not a differentiating factor in terms of is certain information only required for sliding fee scale discount patient or uninsured patients. So this, the elements that are listed in the good faith estimate are required for all patients for which we have to provide a good faith estimate for. In addition to that, on the next slide, we have a, another example of the good faith estimate disclaimers. So we do know that there are several disclaimers that we need to include. So making sure that the patient is aware that this is an estimate and not their um, final uh, total charges um, for services and that it's not a contract. So there are various disclaimers that are outlined for us and included um, as we have reviewed already. But also, in addition to the um, it, to the disclaimers, I do want to note, and I know that we have kind of touched on it briefly, but that there is, as Susanna mentioned, the opportunity for the patient to actually engage in a dispute re, uh, uh, resolution process. And um, you will see at the bottom of this template that it tells patients to keep a copy of their good faith estimate in a safe place or to take pictures of it. Um, because if they want to engage in the dispute resolution process, they actually will need um, their estimate to be able to do so. So there is, a, as part of those disclaimers, and as you see there, um, the instruction for patients to make sure that they have their good faith estimate and they'll need that um, if for some reason they dispute the total charges that they are billed in comparison to the estimate that was provided. And then on the last slide that I have here, um, a few thoughts about workflow implementation. And I wish we had more time to really think through this because I think the brevity of this slide is really deceiving. And part of the role that I provide with health centers and healthcare providers, I think is trying to figure out how do we take regulation and align it or meet it with reality, right? So here's the regulation, it's gonna meet reality. Now, how do we actually operationalize this? And I think a lot of the questions surround scheduling, they surround estimates and actually producing the GFEs. So 
obviously understanding the requirements, whether we like them or not, um, to develop a policy for the health center is the first place to start. So let's start thinking about how are we going to operationalize it? I know that there have been some requests for some sample um, operating procedures or standard operation operating procedures, and I think that Jervain is going to address those. But starting to think through what our policy is and making sure that we have our arms wrapped around what the requirements are so that we can include those. And then begin to document in procedure format. Educating our staff is going to be key to your compliance with this regulation. We likely are going to need to have distinct procedures that are step by step. So as I'm working with health centers now, we're evaluating the processes that we already have in place that may be helpful in relation to the GFE requirements and trying to determine if we can administer the GFE procedures kind of parallel with our current processes. So, for example, one of the questions that I probably have received most frequently and I've seen it a lot in the Q&A today is how do we know the ICD-10 or the CPT code? Kind of the knee jerk reaction I think I've heard is, well, we don't like it's impossible to know. And while I think that the certainty of any of the data elements requested um, can really only be assured to some extent after the visit, most of you as health centers are already gathering some of that information prior to the visit. So think about a patient who's scheduling for a follow up appointment. You likely know um, what their expected diagnosis is going to be. For new or acute patient visits, there's a concept in coding that in lieu of a definitive diagnosis that we can code signs or symptoms. And I'm not suggesting that the regulation directs the same, but while we're waiting for clarification on various operational aspects of this rule, I think we can really begin to try to comply um, because I really think the intent of the rule is clear that it's for us to be as accurate as possible in providing that information to the patient. The same with CPT codes, you know, a lot of you are gathering appointment types. So you're looking at appointment types, new patients might get longer appointments than established patients who might have preventive visits. So I think we can start to look at appointment types to then help us further down the road of trying to ascertain CPT codes for the patient or associated out of pocket expense or for their estimate. So what I'm suggesting and the health centers I'm working with is, okay, well, let's kind of step away from what feels very overwhelming, look at what we're doing currently, and then how can we, you know, again, bring those processes parallel to what we're doing in, in conjunction with the GFE regulations. Um, the last thing, and I have more I wanted to offer, but I know we're to top time, excuse me, and we wanna be able to um, take some questions um, for you, but uh, Susanna mentioned this, and I certainly had this in my thoughts too, but work with your EHR and your practice management system. So a lot of this can be documented through those processes, and this is a regulation that is um, applicable to widespread providers. So our uh, systems that we utilize are going to have to develop ways to help support us in these processes. So reaching out, and we've already done this already, when I say we use some health centers that I am working with to say, okay, what is happening with our systems and how can they support us in capturing the information? So with that, again, I'm gonna limit my comments. I, I wish we had more time to share, but we'll have more time certainly as we kind of move forward with the implementation of this rule. Um, I'll kind of turn it back to Jervine. The last thing, you know, before I do that though, is um, I do wanna mention that as your organization is working through how do we operationalize um, the requirements is also considering some sort of verification or quality control process. So once we have our procedures in place for issuing good faith estimates, um, making sure that we have the ability or a mechanism in place to look at patient bills or statements that are going to be rendered in conjunction with the GFE to try to ensure that we're being as compliant as possible as we begin to send patient statements who have also um, received estimates from us. So with that, thank you for um, allowing me to share a few thoughts with you. And Jervine, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thanks so much, Rebecca. And I'm gonna ask you to come back and present after we're in this for like a month or so and give some of the experiences that you're having with some of the health center clients that, that you work with in the field on actually implement, implementing this and making this operational. But I have a couple of questions. We still have 
over 500 people on the call. So I'm going to ask, just um, throw out a couple of questions to the panel and ask maybe three or four questions before we close out for today. Okay. So, and you kind of answered this one, Rebecca. Seems like we have to have the we have to query the provider for the diagnosis and the CPT code each time we have a GFB request based on the of recent visits. So I guess we need to do that for every visit. So I don't think there's anything in the requirements that says we have to query the providers. I think how we get to the ICD-10 and the CPT codes is kind of an open question. So as we wait for further clarification, as I mentioned, I think for follow-up appointments, we have an expected ICD-10 code, and I think that we can word it as such in our GFE that this is what is expected. And then for those acute patients or new patients, if we don't have a definitive diagnosis, if I kind of, again, kind of um, re, re uh, kind of pull from coding rules that we can use signs or symptoms. Um, I think that we have the ability to do our best to try to get to an anticipated diagnosis code for the patient. Um, I will say there may be times when we just don't, but until we get further clarification, I think instead of dismissing that element, that we do have ways that we can try to address both the ICD-10 and the CPT codes, and just making sure that the patient is clear in our conversations that the, the, these are nothing is final until they've actually seen the, the provider. So we're not diagnosing. We're not trying to do any of those things for the patient, but trying to give them some additional information for a financial kind of transaction. Thank you so much. Okay, for the panel as a FQHC is the patient. If a patient is enrolled in our sliding fee discount program, is that considered a federal health care program? Health care program. It's in the Social Security Act. Um, it, as I mentioned, it definitely includes those federal and federal state programs that function as insurance, like Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP. Uh, but it also includes federal programs that directly or indirectly financially support the provision of services. So it's broader than just those programs that function as insurance. Um, CMS, in a fact sheet on this rule, uh, stated that they consider that programs such as the Indian Health Service uh, program constitute FHCPs, such that if you're an IHS patient, you're considered a, a federal health care program enrollee and you don't need to get this good faith estimate as an uninsured self-pay patient. The Federal Health Center program for the grantees under Section 330 similarly provides federal financial support, uh, both, you know, that health centers can expend both through using their sliding fee discount program for those under 200% of poverty, but also generally to make services available in medically underserved areas. Um, we did uh, try to argue pretty forcefully in NAC's comments on this uh, interim final rule that the Section 330 program should be considered a federal health care program for this purpose. And so, therefore, health center patients, whether or not you're receiving discounts under the, F, uh, uh, the sliding fee discount program, are enrollees in a federal health care program. Um, that doesn't seem to be an issue that was on the radar of the agencies um, so far. So I think it's fair to say that as of January 1, you need to be going ahead and providing this estimate to uninsured and self-pay patients, regardless of whether they're entitled to discounts under the SFDP, and then perhaps it, policy advocacy might result in a revision. But uh, um, at this time, even though there's a good argument that, it, that Section 330 is a federal health care program, we don't have any evidence that the agencies view it that way. Okay. And, and Brian made a comment in here. I want to go ahead and address it. He said that the presentation today has been very frustrating because we're just saying to hire more consultants and spend more money. And Brian, I don't think we're saying that. I think we're thinking you need to look at your whole process and figure out what you have in place already and what you can use that you have in place and already in order to respond to this good faith estimate. And let, let's be clear, this is not your whole patient population. These are uninsured or self-pay patients that request a good faith estimate. So I think we should all just kind of be calm right now and then wait until January 1, educate our patients and our employees on this new ruling and then see what the volumes we're receiving. Because 
if a patient comes to you and say, I want a good faith estimate, but then you say, but then we have our sliding fee discount or we have our prompt pay discount and we can also give you a good faith estimate, you know, if you have a sliding fee and the patient is eligible, you have the resources and that you can go ahead and take them down that road. So you don't have to do this for every patient every time. So I, I appreciate your comment. And I, and I, I know this is very frustrating. One of the questions we had ahead of time was, who thinks this is a good idea? And I think no one does. They have the patients at heart, and that's what they're trying to do to protect the patients. But this is a situation where people put into regulation who aren't used to actually providing health care. So that's the nuances from going from regulations to, op to operations. So we're trying to help you and give you some tools and resources and things to think about in order to get this going. We have a lot of questions. We're going to do a follow-up. Definitely pull Rebecca back to do some real live, you know, situations on what she's experiencing and go through some of these Q and A's. I'm sorry we ran out of time today, but thank you so much for your comments. Hey, Jervine. Um, we'll follow up. Yes. Jervine, can I answer one question that's process related? Is that okay? That's that's policy process. Absolutely. All right. There was a Absolutely. question. Of, there was a question about. Um, sorry, just everybody, bear with me for seven seconds. Um, when, how will we know if our submitted comments will have an impact on the IFR? That's the interim final rule itself, or if there will be amendment for clarity of the IFR itself. So, uh, Susanna, weigh in here as well. Um, the best answer I have is I don't know, in the sense that, you know, there were, I think, somewhere between the let when we submitted our comments, I think I saw about 4,000 comments that were submitted. In response to this, that's a ton of comments, and I think we all know what time you know time of the year it is on the calendar. And so, whether there will be any sort of concrete response between now and January one, we are operating, and we are recommending to all of you to operate under a scenario where we will not have any new clarity. What they have put out is what they have put out, and we have to act accordingly. Um, so that's my answer to that question. But really, like it wasn't a platitude when I said earlier on the call. Like we don't view January 1 of 2022 as the end of it. If we don't get new feedback on this in the next, you know, 14 days, it's not like we're just going to close up shop and then say, okay, it is what it is. We are still going to continue to push for clarity or some sort of relief, whether that is happening though, we don't know. Susanna, would you add anything to that? No, I think that's accurate. And so this it's kind of a paradox, an interim final rule with comment. It's issued in final and they're asking you what you think about it. <laughs> so it's not a notice, it's not a proposed rule where they have to publish it, get the public's feedback, and then finalize it. They issued it in final and asked for comment, but any changes they make would need to be made through a new regulation. So as Jeremy said, there's no requirement that they address the comments or any particular timetable for it. And Jervine, if I could plug one other thing, like I'm seeing all the questions in here. They are, in, there's a lot of really, really good questions. This is not a solution to many of them, but the reg itself that lays out this good faith estimate requirement is actually pretty descriptive. Now I get that when you start to unpack it, it just leads to 10 other questions. And that is, I, I get it, like I really do get it. And uh, I couldn't imagine being in the shoes of many of you that are that are hearing this, but I would encourage many of you as you figure out how to, how to deal with this, read that, you know, look through that reg. And Susanna, would you add anything to that? I mean, there are, it does lay out a fair way, fairly decent roadmap as regs go as to how to comply with this, so. I, I agree that it is it is very detailed and then you link can link directly from the red to the materials that CMS has provided in in model form. So there, there is a lot of detail there to follow. Thanks, Jervin. I know everybody would love to jump off. So I appreciate okay. everybody listening to us for another minute or two. So so I do have one clarification. So Susanna, you can help me on this. So when do you provide a GFE? Okay. Yes, and, and I did want to clarify that a bit. I think you said it was Brian who expressed frustration about the fact that this uh, requirement is being saddled on for the uninsured and self-pay patients. Um, I, so um, it's true. This is a new requirement associated with serving these patients, and your Section 330 grant is, in most cases, the main vehicle through which you're you know, financing your care of this population. So I, I understand your frustration. As for when it has to be provided, there are two triggers. A, a patient who's uninsured or self-pay makes an appointment three or more business days in advance for services, or B, a patient who is uninsured or self-pay requests a good faith estimate. Either one of those two 
um, you have to go ahead and provide it and provide it in writing. So the exception would be the uninsured or self pay who makes an appointment that's less than three days in advance. Thank you so much, Susanna, for that clarification, because I saw a couple of questions in there. And with that, so this is just the beginning. I mean, there's still a lot more out there, and we will definitely give you as many resources as possible. I did see a comment in there if the CMS forms are available in Spanish, and I can work to see if we can have NAC translate those into Spanish, because I think that would be a great resource for all of you guys. So I'll take ownership of that. And with that, I will end it today and I will look forward to, I'm sure I'll be pulling this panel back uh, in 2022 to get some more on this. But if you guys have any questions, any concerns or any recommendations, please feel free to reach out to us and thank you so much. Happy holidays and have a great weekend.